Welcome to Fireside Tats. I'm Jake, the host of the show, the official podcast of the Tattoo Improvement Network. Go to tattooimprovement.com. Sign up for our mailing list. Why does nobody do that? They don't want to get email. I don't blame you. We won't try to sell you anything. We'll just let you know what we're up to. Uh, we're at the, this is the last show of our Atlanta series. We've had a lot of good ones, man. We've had painters, badass painters, uh, tattooers, and now we hooked a big fish. We got uh, the Russ Abbott here. Tattooer, entrepreneur, musician. What else? Hmm. I'm about, about covered it. Covers it. Father. Good. Father. Father of three. Yeah. Man. See? It's full time. Husband. Husband, yeah. father. <laughs> How long have you been playing banjo? Maybe 10 years now. Yeah. But play. I've only really been serious about it for two or three years. Do you play with a band or with a group regularly or just kind of? No, them? that's sort of a dream. You yeah. know, I just want to be able to play well enough to. You know, maybe yeah. get on a stage someday and not embarrass myself. But yeah, yeah. at this point, no. Yeah, no. Lo- lofty goals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, most everyone that tattoos uh, is going to know Russ. He's been uh, he's been huge in the tattoo community for a long time. Uh, but we do have a lot of uh, viewers that are not tattooers. So we'll start with just um, maybe a little bit of a background. How long you been tattooing? Where you started? How you got started? All right. Sure. I've been tattooing in the Atlanta area since 1997. <laughs> And um, I got started, I ordered the kit and started tattooing out of my dorm room at Georgia State University. Hmm. I was taking some classes, you know, first year in college, just out of high school and thinking about maybe going into a design career or something artistic. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And uh, I got inspired to uh, to just try tattooing as a hobby. I found out you could order kits. uh, (laughs) A lot of us found that out. Exactly. and so I, I got the kit from Spalding and Rogers mm-hmm. with, you know, all the little, all the actually pretty big books full of flash, but little pictures, you know, yeah. they're yeah. an inch tall or whatever. And did uh, it come with the tattooing A to Z book? Or it no? did. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's how I knew what to do. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, uh, <laughs> so I, I had the, uh, the flash books first and the only reason I really got them was because at first I was just excited to draw things like dragons and koi fish and all this imagery that, you know, I was, I sort of knew about, I, I didn't know a lot about tattooing. I'd maybe seen like two tattoo magazines at the time. <laughs> Did and, you have any tattoos? Um, at, at that point I had maybe two tattoos that were also mm. done by an amateur oh, okay. in the house, Yeah. in the kitchen. Um, so I didn't know anything. Yeah. You know, I was just, I was sort of enamored by the idea of tattooing. But I didn't know where my life was heading. You know, I was 19 right. years old, so right. It was it was such a closed yeah. network at that point that it, it was, was tough to find. Nothing like it is today. So yeah, yeah. so I I got the kit. Um, well, first, like like I said, I got the catalogs and I started drawing. And uh, but that other part of the catalog with all the equipment just sort of kept calling my name. And yeah. so I ordered the stuff. I spent like seven hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah. You know, credit card. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, I had fifty dollars of my own cash <laughs> right. to put in on it, but I tattooed nonstop for like eleven days straight after I got the kit. I huh. tattooed one person a day, and you know, if they're still around, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, <laughs> but um, <laughs> sort of one thing led to another. I ended up leaving school, tattooing out of my parents' basement for a few months. Got a job tattooing out of a music store oh, in wow. my hometown that was also doing body piercing. Were there any other tattooers there, or were you? No, the no, entire- no, no, no. I went in because I knew I needed an autoclave. I knew <laughs> yeah, that that was, right. you know, that the solution I was soaking my needles and tubes in maybe wasn't, <laughs> wasn't industry ideal. standard. So <laughs> yeah, I went yeah. in there because they had a body piercer, and I thought mm. maybe I could convince them to let me sterilize my stuff in their autoclave. Yeah. So. I went in there, and the guy was like, man, we just think about hiring a tattoo guy, man. Why don't you come on, run one on me, and we'll see how you do. Right. And uh, so I did. I went down and ran one on. And uh, 
it was it was good enough. So I was huh. I was tattooing in a CD store. Wow! And um, thankfully they fired me after a month. <laughs> That's good, <clears throat> probably because you know I didn't I didn't really know how to draw tattoos. I was just taking those little pictures from the flash catalog and. Mm-hmm putting them on the copier and blowing it up as big as the copier would allow. (laughs) So this would become this, you know, and then a few more times. And by the time I got it up to size, it was a blurry mess and you couldn't (laughs) see what was what. So, um, I still have my old portfolio from that time. From that time. Wow. I'll show it to you. But okay. So thankfully that I got fired. What what reason they, they they fired me. Well, they didn't really give me a reason. I, I went out of town. I met a guy who, um, had great tattoos, the best tattoos I'd ever seen. He was from New York City, yeah. and he told me that he needed a ride back to New York City, and he would show me around and show me some tattoos and yeah. introduce me to his friends. I could tattoo all his buddies. Wow. I was just like, that sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I went up to New York City, and when I got back, they had taken down my little hand-painted <laughs> tattooing <laughs> available sign, sign uh, off the wall, and the piercer had moved into my station. Yeah. And uh, I'll put all my stuff in a box for me. Huh. I was like, okay. How was that working? Were you, just, thing. <laughs> were you just renting that space from them, or were they taking a percentage of the, like a shop would? Or? Um, well, I didn't. <laughs> never told this story in so much detail publicly. <laughs> oh, I just, I've never That's heard right. anything like yeah, this. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had been tattooed by a guy named Vampire Brian down in <laughs> Panama City. Yeah. And um, he was the first tattooer that I'd encountered who was like, yeah, you seem cool kid. Like I'll, mm-hmm. I'll show you a few things. So he taught me about using like ointment to stick my ink caps down. Right. You know? <laughs> like, he taught whoa. me about putting bags on my bottles. <laughs> yeah. You know? Some, some yeah. great stuff. Yeah. So I was like, man, I guess I need to figure out how tattoo shops work before mm-hmm. I can tattoo out of the CD store. Right. So I called vampire Brian. I was like, Hey man, like how do tattoo shops work? And he told me, well, okay, well, usually you split it 50, 50 with the shop, you know? And he told me if, if you supply all your own stuff, it's 60, 40. And you know, like tattooers listening to this now know that that's a way oversimplification right. of how it actually might work. And yeah. most, most shops are different now but yeah. anyway, but, but it was a good, good starting um, point. Yeah. So that's what he told me. And I was like, all right, well, 60, 40 sounds better to me. I'll take <laughs> the 60. So I'll just tell them that I'm supplying myself. And so I turned around and told the CD shop owners that I was going to supply all my own stuff and they would get 40%. And they said, okay, <laughs> perfect. Yeah. <laughs> it's all very professional. Yeah. It sounds like it. <laughs> so about a month of that and got fired, thankfully. And then I got an apprenticeship, okay. you know, the, the guy who apprenticeship apprentice me his name was uh tory troll putman and um unfortunately he recently passed away yeah. but he was uh he was a great mentor and he taught me all those things that i didn't know about yeah. how to tattoo properly and how to look at tattooing how to look at the craft with respect you know mm-hmm. and all those things that i wasn't really on a path to figuring out on my own right you were pretty fortunate to that he was willing to take you on since you were already tattooing as well huh yeah yeah he said I had to bring all my equipment, my, my two, I had to bring, still have your original guys. machines. Oh yeah. Nice. <laughs> Look how tiny they are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had to bring these in my, uh, giant toaster oven, oh, yeah? um, power supply and my tattoo artist t-shirt. <laughs> right. All that stuff has to <laughs> come then, with you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think he kept the shirt. I never found it again. Oh. But, uh, you know, he kept it all. He said if I quit the apprenticeship that I wasn't getting it back. And he didn't want me tattooing out of my house while, right. you know, I was you know, under the, the umbrella of his shop. Sure, so, sure. Yeah, you know. yeah. We, we talk a decent amount. We have a lot of people that are already tattooing uh, and will send us questions about getting an apprenticeship. And that's the first thing we always tell them is like, first off, stop tattooing. Yeah. Start drawing. <laughs> when you go to get that apprenticeship, don't bother telling the guy that you've already been tattooing. That's probably a good, yeah. good idea. You know, I never told him about the oh, CD the, store. Oh, okay. That's he, knew, probably, he knew that I was tattooing, but I just yeah. felt like the CD store thing was was just an example of me being a little too big for my britches. You right. know, like having a little bit too much cockiness and yeah. confidence. And, uh, and yeah. then as soon as I got a little bit further into it, I always regretted not telling him about the CD store. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> I was afraid he would find out and I would, right. I would get in He'd trouble. Be screwed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so that, so that kind of explains, I, I think a little bit about how you, I mean, you're obviously pretty passionate about teaching and, and helping other artists. You do a lot of seminars, you've got the 
book, the ornamental book, obviously mm-hmm. the color wheel, which we're going to talk about today. Um, that has a lot to do, I guess, with you have struggling early on and then finding a solid mentor and seeing what a huge impact it made on you, huh? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, the the opportunity to share what little I've been able to figure out mm-hmm. and, and see other people, you know, make some progress in their own career and in their own artwork is is what really drives me to do that. Yeah, yeah. One thing I think is kind of rare with you too, we, we don't see it a ton, maybe a little more now, uh, but uh, you're very entrepreneurial. You're, you know, you're an inventor even at, at this yeah, point, I guess. I guess so, I can uh, claim that title now. Yeah, yeah, so um, we, we don't see, those two things don't always go hand in hand. People that mm-hmm. are, that are, well, I shouldn't say creative, but a lot of times tattooers, artists in general are kind of introverted. They struggle a little bit to get in front of a microphone or to offer up their, offer up their knowledge or to try to help people out, even though they're more than capable of it, if they could just get out and do it. And it's mm-hmm. kind of a rare combination, I think, to, to find someone that is kind of, I don't know either, any other word than entrepreneurial um, uh, and, and a real solid tattooer. And so you don't find that a lot. And I think. I just have maybe three or four ideas a day, yeah. <laughs> it yeah. seems like, and you know, a hundred bad ideas will happen before, yeah. for, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'm just always jumping from one thing to the other and trying to figure out what to do, Yeah, you know, and, and, you know, the Abbott color wheel, for instance, is just part of a long series of ideas that, mm-hmm. that eventually led down this road. But yeah, um, well, yeah, you know, I, I, I enjoy making things outside of tattooing mm-hmm. and, I enjoy art direction and typography and graphic yeah. design and marketing and all these other avenues. So yeah, yeah, obviously, just try, to, try to kind of keep my brain busy. Right, and obviously, and we got some great footage of the shop yesterday. And if you guys, um, we may plug that into this episode as well, maybe. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you definitely—it's obvious that you have a real eye for design and and attention to detail outside of just tattooing, just in every aspect of your life. It seems like. Um, all right, well, let's move on to the color wheels. Uh, the, Color theory, I guess, um, obviously, are people that don't have an art background that get into tattooing, maybe that just drew a lot. I know a lot of people, you know, were just into comics and they did a lot of, we, we just interviewed someone the other day that just said he sketched like crazy for his whole life and he struggled so much to get used to the idea of color and, and, and technically putting in color solidly. And color, a lot of people struggle uh, with it. Did I guess you'd recognize that there was a, a need for that. And um, yeah, well, I struggled with it. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't, I never took art college classes on color mm-hmm. theory. You know, yeah. the things that I know I've learned through experience and reading mm-hmm. and just, um, you know, endless hours spent on the web, reading everything that's out there and, yeah. and sort of piling it all together into something that made sense to me and then putting it all into practice and then bringing it back. And, but I started teaching seminars. Um, my first seminar was an illustrative tattooing seminar. So mm-hmm. I colored, I covered color in, in my use of it at the time. I gave people a list of, I was using four different brands of ink. Yeah. You know, so I gave them a list of, here's the ones from these different companies that I found to be, you know, good, successful inks for tattooing. And, you know, color theory was something that was sort of the next logical step from that seminar, mm-hmm. you know, and I started using just eternal ink. No, I, I discovered that I was happy with their entire palette. Mm-hmm. You know, there were a few colors that gave me trouble, but they actually, you know, in the case of like uh, nuclear green and graffiti green, which mm-hmm. were, you know, really hard to get in the skin back yeah. then. Yeah. They actually gave me the opportunity to, to kind of work with them. Oh, People really? don't know that, but, um, you know, when I first started using internal ink, I was like, I don't like these colors. I can't get them in. And did you just email me, them? But and- everyone else can't get them in either. <laughs> like, can we, change these and um they were they were like sure yeah how how would we do that you know like how can we how would you do it and i was like well i would get lightning yellow and put green concentrate into it yeah you know (laughs) until it looks like that color and um and i have no idea what they were doing before that but but that formula they're using now is yeah is 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 lightning yellow as far as i know hmm. i mean i'm not really in the inner circle at eternal but you know they they uh they sent me a new bottle and and it works works, works great yeah. You know? yeah i still never use that color because it doesn't really appeal to me but yeah yeah I, you know, i'm the same i like those. my greens a little bit different than that but yeah you know? but i i almost 
personally, I've, I've limited my palette a lot. I've, I've backed off of tattooing a lot and paint more and more. And I've started to work. I do a lot of painting workshops. And of course, you show up at a workshop mm -hmm. with some rock star painter and they're like, bring every one of these colors from this manufacturer. And, you know, we're going to use this medium and you're going to use this primed linen. And so everyone wants you to use what they use. And so um, I found by doing those that there are a handful of colors that I just find myself a pigments and paint, at least, that I find myself going to over and over. And, um, and in tattooing, I think one reason I started to, to incorporate um, a, a more limited palette is that I, I do a lot of bigger pieces, and so I would end up maybe being a couple of months out before I worked on the piece again, and I used this particular mint green. I'm like, oh shit, we're out of that mint green. Well, now mm -hmm. I know if I just always have these six mm -hmm. inks laid out, I can make that green. Uh, it, because I'm used to mixing paint now, mm -hmm. and uh, and I never have to worry about being out of a color because I just know I always have these. There's no real specialty colors with that yeah. I use anymore. I just use this set, and I'm like, well, obviously I use these colors to make that one time. I'll just figure out yeah. what that is a second time. Well, I think that works if you're doing a painterly style. Right. You know, like right. if you're a tattooer who is putting the exact color that mm -hmm. you want in every time, versus you know having a few colors blend and morph into each other. Yeah. Yeah, they, yeah, maybe think, a different process is right. a good idea. I mean, what I personally do is I have every single color. I see, and I I use maybe there's more of them up here. Wow, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we've uh, we got a few more around the shop somewhere. <laughs> but I have um, I have every single color on the color wheel, mm -hmm. and I always look to that and figure out mm -hmm. which color it is I'm looking for. So I rarely ever mix them anymore, you know, because I feel like they. They put something in the bottle that's close that's enough close to what to I'm what going for, you know. So, and I, yeah. I take notes. We have a software, computer software that we use. Um, Tattoo Management Studio oh. is what we use to, you know, run the appointments and mm -hmm. all the uh, and you record can make keeping notes in the shop. For specific tattoos, right? So I have a client file, and yeah. I'll, I'll tell the front desk, you know, this is what I use. these are the colors I use today, and then. The, that'll always be accessible. Wow. I, I jump in six months from now and they've got a list of the colors that I used. Wow. Uh, you that's know, really I think it's well a really planned. good, yeah. a, good uh, a good way of approaching it because yeah. a lot of times after they settle in, you know, depending on the skin color, I could have a really hard time even telling totally. what color it was. Sure, sure. Uh, so, I mean, we're going to get in and maybe show some examples of the color wheel. Someone like mm -hmm. me that... Um, that's probably not going to use every color, or maybe it won't, won't even use Eternal for everything. That's not an, mm -hmm. you can still get some value out of this thing. For yeah, sure. absolutely. Um, uh, basically, by by um, uh, whenever you reveal these, and we'll go through. Maybe we should grab that thing and, and show um, how the gamut masks and all that kind of thing work. Right. I mean, you can opt. You could you could use the the limited palette that I'm talking about mm -hmm. and mix any one of these colors this thing would just serve as a general guide right. for you at that point well i always tell people just get all the brightest colors hmm. you know because yeah. most of what you have you know, if you go back to when i started tattooing in 97 mm -hmm. we had a lot less colors available um, the reason is because the manufacturers of the ink weren't mixing up a whole bunch of semi-neutrals and neutrals right you know they if anything you maybe had like a, a yellow ochre you had a gray mm -hmm. You had black, you had white, you had a flesh tone, like one, yeah, <laughs> one yeah. flesh tone. It was just right. called flesh. <laughs> right, right. You know, I, I started out with national homogenized, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, I did. So too. that's what I had. I had, I didn't even have an ochre at that point. I yeah, had, I had a flesh. Um, yeah, but um, you know, and so what you can do is take those bright colors, and you can find out if you have red. What's red's complement? It's mm -hmm. green on the opposite side of the color wheel from red. So if you mix red and green together, they start to desaturate each other. The reds with a little bit of green, it becomes darker and it becomes less bright. Mm -hmm. So the same is true of the green. If you add a little red to the green, it becomes a little darker, a little less bright. Somewhere in the middle, they make this mud color right. that if you add white or gray or black to it, becomes a whole lot of other mud colors. Mm -hmm. And what you start to see is, oh my God, there's hot chocolate from right. eternal you know like yeah. as you mess around with this stuff and that's what i did i i got all the brights figured out which ones those were and i put them on a glass palette with a paintbrush and a um, cup of water hmm. and lots of paper towels lots yeah. of clean water yeah. and i just started you know pouring out little little pallets of of tattoo paint you know hmm. tattoo ink and mixing them together and seeing what colors i got out of it and then adding white to those or adding gray to those and 
sort of I just reversed engineered yeah. a lot of Eternals inks and figured out more or less you know what they what, what they were making them from and mm-hmm. a lot of times they were mixing compliments or sometimes they would just take a bright color and add gray to it mm-hmm. you know if you use a, a gray made of black and white mm-hmm. you know that's a lot of what's happening so you know all you really have to travel with once you understand that stuff is all the bright colors bright plus colors. lots of black and lots of white yeah yeah that's that's really a lot that's more work than i than i thought had I don't mean it that way that I thought had gone into it. I, I assumed that they had helped you to make all those decisions. And no. I didn't realize that you were hand mixing pigments no. and, and determining That was part them. of it. I, I found a way to um, digitally measure tattoo pigment mm-hmm. that I still keep a secret. But yeah. um, what I'm doing is I'm getting the precise color of the pigment. Hmm. And then I'm pulling that into a digital space and I'm organizing it. I ter- turn a color, say if it's a lipstick red. <clears throat> take it into Photoshop and turn it black and white. And then I can pair lipstick red to the value scale. Mm-hmm. You got a 10 step value scale from white to 10%, 20%, 30%, all the way to black is 100%. And I figure out where lipstick red fits on the value scale. Mm-hmm. And then it's placed on top of that band. So yeah. what a lot of people don't realize about color is saturation or brightness in a color can throw the eye off mm-hmm. and you won't realize that a color that appears to be bright is actually a lot darker in right. value or lighter in value than your eye thinks. Right. <clears throat> so you can make comparisons now. You can say, all right, flamingo pink here is at, I think, uh, 50 or 60%. It's actually the same value as, say, graffiti green mm-hmm. over here. Yeah. So now I might make the decision to place those two next to each other in a tattoo just to the, so they would stay the same value. Mm-hmm. You, can, you can get into some really like wild, playful effects Yeah, by messing with that. And I, I think really to me that's one of the most valuable, uh, I haven't had a chance to actually use the color wheel yet, but in my experience that's one of the most valuable things I think you can take from this is understanding, uh, to me value comes first, I think to mm-hmm. value comes to me before color or, or right. even you know, the drawing and when it comes to painting especially. and. Um, uh, people will often take two high key colors that are maybe um, maybe they're complementaries, and they think that they're creating some contrast. Well, they're the exact same value. They mm-hmm. don't really create any contrast, uh, or at least not as dynamic value contrast. Value contrast. Right. They don't create as yeah. dynamic of a contrast as you might want, and especially mm-hmm. if you're trying to deal with something atmospheric, where you've got a you know you're trying to separate a foreground from a middle ground, from mm-hmm. a background, or or whatever, and you think, well, I'm just going to use the complementary. The, gra- the dragon's green, so I'm going to use a, a complementary red in the background to push the dragon out. Mm-hmm. Well, it, yeah, from a from a uh, from a color standpoint, that might work. But if you also pushed the value and you used right. a very deep or light value green, mm-hmm. or, vi- or vice versa, sure. uh, and uh, and then also the chroma, you know how right. how intense it is, you can really get a lot more dynamic effect. And this right. thing's a great tool for that. Thanks. I, I like the idea of a black and gray tattooer, someone who's just mm-hmm. only comfortable with thinking about value, grabbing this tool and just thinking, okay, it's a 30% gray, mm-hmm. and then going up there and finding what colors in the range of hue that they think they're going for yeah. are you know, the right one and just plugging it in. I, that's something I'm really excited to see. I, I'd be really, really interested yeah. to see how, how really good black and gray tra- tattooers translate that as and well. And then once it's in color, take a photo and turn it black and white and <laughs> right. see how it looks compared to what they would have done with just grays. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you talked about um, uh, bringing a lipstick red into Photoshop and then and then mm-hmm. changing, it, changing it to grayscale. And um, I've recommended that to... Um, to some of the apprentices of the younger artists that come through our shop to photograph their actual tattoos or their drawings, copy mm-hmm. their drawings and change them to grayscale and see just how, are, are they pushing their darks as, as hard as they can and mm-hmm. are they backing off their lights as much as they can or do they have just a lot of 40 to mm-hmm. 60% grays to the entire tattoo? Yeah, I would say most people do. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's an area that a lot of artists could stand to improve in. They get mm-hmm. a little bit, you know, they always hear, especially with tattooing, you gotta have a lot of black. Mm-hmm. But they never have the ability to understand how much black we're talking about, <laughs> right. you know, like it's, you know, it, it makes a lot of difference when you start thinking about value first and then plugging in color later. Yeah. And that's the, the process that I use and it's what I recommend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we have these gamut masks. Yeah. That's what I want to go into next. If you want. All right. So this is a <laughs> removable vinyl decal 
that I have of the color wheel. So mm -hmm. I use this for just reminding myself what colors I have and helping to plan out gradients. Mm -hmm. what this is for this is for choosing color schemes. So let's say you're doing a tattoo and um, your client has requested a color. Pick a color that your client wants. Red. Okay, your client wants red. All right, so your first thought might be to keep it simple and do a complementary color scheme. So these two windows are showing red and its complement green mm -hmm. and all the values and options that Eternal Inc. has in those, in those ranges. So you have some colors that are more or less saturated. You know, you have some colors that are brighter, some more dull, mm -hmm. and you can decide by looking at them which one's the right one for your situation. But pick the, um, there's lipstick red. You know you want that. Can you do this tattoo with these colors? Just these colors. Yeah. Maybe not. not. Likely. Okay, so the next thing you could try is just to open up one side and switch this to a split complementary. There's red, and now you have a wider range of options on this side. Mm -hmm. And this one's a lot more useful because now you can dial in red in different ways. You can get red in right here, mm -hmm. or you can get red in right here. Mm -hmm. So then you're in, and in so this that's case, four you're different options. Right. And you're just thinking about temperature at that point. You're like, mm -hmm. well, do I want this to meet? You're looking at your design and mm -hmm. you're saying, what what colors do I possibly need in here? You know, it's what else is what are you, what are you tattooing? Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> it's yeah. a hypothetical, yeah, but sure. I think uh, you're just looking at it and saying, will this work or not? Mm -hmm. And another thing is you're opening up your uh, your mind to the idea of using brighter or more dull right. choices as well. So maybe you want red to be the most intense eye catching part of the design and you want to draw the viewer's eye directly to that red part, mm -hmm. then you might decide, all right, I'm going to tone down some of these other colors. I'm going to use more grayed out versions of them so I don't uh -huh. run into, or so that I can direct the eye using the bright color. Yeah. And then the exact opposite kind of uh, idea of what you were just talking about, if you wanted to do that, you may dodge the greens that are on that same value line as you come across and say, that's I don't a great want point. That. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a great point. Yeah, that's fantastic. So that's a split complementary color mm -hmm. scheme, and there's there's a total of five gamut masks in here. Well, we also have monochromatic, which is that can be fun, but I don't I don't know if it works in our case. You mm -hmm. know, we're just using all the values of red, mm -hmm. and then we also have analogous, which are colors that are next to each other on the yeah any three wheel. hues mm -hmm. side by side on the color wheel. You'd have something like that. And then one of the most useful ones, kind of the old standard for tattooing is the triadic. Mm -hmm. And this is the primary triad because you have yellow, red, and blue mm -hmm. showing. But you could, so let's take that idea and say, okay, I know that I like the way that red, yellow, and blue look together. But what if I shift into something that's a little bit more magenta, mm -hmm. turquoise, and yellow, orange? Yeah. You know, so now you can start to find the things that you always do and rotate them start in start. one direction or the other and, and get something new. That's the same relationship, but gives you a whole new palette of colors to work with. Yeah. Yeah. And that's I mean, and when you do and we all fall into the the trap of just using uh, going to our old trustees and using the same setup. And right. and uh, just to be able to visualize that so easily and be able to say, well, this is basically what I'm doing. What if I just shifted that? What if I weren't just using all the all the yeah. primaries? What if I did the same kind of setup using secondaries or right. uh, or just changing the temperature slightly? I think that's uh, that's yeah, that, that, that's just incredibly value, valuable. Can you guys see? Um, on the, we're changing out cameras on the zooming camera. Sorry guys. But, the, um, can you guys see how these things work? Did you zoom in? Yeah, where you can, yeah, we okay. Shots of it. Okay. Yeah, so, two okay. So basically uh, he has different patterns that line up at different points that, that, that are associated with the different, um, the, with the different, uh, colored. Right. That's schemes. one thing people get confused by when you first hand it to them. They think that this opening is mm -hmm. somehow has something to do with the color that you see through the window right there. Right. Um, that's not actually the case. Well, all you're looking at is the pattern, you know, and seeing that you've got this little hexagon and there's the hexagon pattern there. Right. And when you have that lined up, you're on split complementary. In order to get analogous, you switch to this pattern. Mm -hmm. 
So it makes yeah. sense once you uh, kind it, of fidget with it for a while, but you're not looking at what color is showing in this arrow over here. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and it you know it took me like I said I just got mine in the mail right before we made the trip to Atlanta. It took me all of two minutes to figure out exactly how that worked. It's really simple once you get it. One other thing that I like that you did, and I was curious about. I didn't know how much you would assume people understood about um, uh, about the about how it not about the technically how it works, but but how you would explain split complementary or monochromatic mm -hmm. or anything like that. How much you would assume that artists already knew, and I think you did a nice job. I don't want to say of dumbing it down, but but of simplifying mm -hmm. what those things, uh, what those yeah. different uh, we color can grab schemes the, are about. Uh, the package and show yeah, that. yeah. Let's see if people can maybe see that because it's uh, that was one thing I really wondered how how you were going to pull off or if you were going to reference someone else's material and say, hey, if you want to know more about these uh, uh, about these palettes, then uh, look here. Or, well, the the best resource for gamut masks is J James Gurney's yeah. book, uh, yeah. Color, Color and Light. Light. And, and it's, you know, it's where I first learned about gamut masks. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if he invented them or not. But, I don't know. It's where I first um, learned of it, too. It was really cool. When I was doing the Kickstarter for the color wheel, I sent James a, an email mm -hmm. and showed him everything that I had. Yeah. And, and, you know, his, his book was mentioned in the, in the video. And, yeah. A, I wanted to make sure that he was okay with it. Sure. And I was hoping that he would talk about it on his blog because he's got the, one of the most amazing art blogs yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, in Did. existence. And um, he ended up posting it. Oh, great. Um, Did he respond? You know, Did you get to talk to him? Yeah, yeah, we've, yeah. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send him one. You know, yeah. I'm, gonna, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm excited for him to, to receive it and he, hear what he thinks about it. You yeah. know, I think that, um, you know, he's, he's just such a genius. I have, have no idea if he's impressed or not. You know? <laughs> right. But I, I think that... Um, I, I think that it's, uh, you know, for his audience, it the comments that I saw under the post seem like they were interested in this idea as well. You know, yeah. it's not just a, a tattooing tool. It's it's really something that all artists can use. And, and James Gurney taught how to make your own gamut masks in his, in his book. Right, and, in the book. And people can certainly do that. You can paint your own color wheel and cut out masks and put them on top and mm -hmm. use that system. Yeah, if you guys have never seen that book or don't own that book, Color and Light, do yourselves a favor and buy it it's it's uh it's just incredible it's packed full like russ is saying he is uh, james garney is just a genius he I, I went to my first portrait society conference which is held here in atlanta a lot um this past year the portrait society of america and normally like for the five years leading up to this year he was the keynote speaker and everyone talks about how what a great guy he was and how what a great keynote he always gives and this year it was um john singer Sargent's great grandson or something and which was still pretty cool mm -hmm. but it was but i really wanted to meet James Gurney and I was yeah. so disappointed that he wasn't there. I'd like but, to meet him too. Yeah. So I wanted to design a package that would protect the wheel mm -hmm. and I got the idea to make it the exact same size as a vinyl record. Yeah. So what you're looking at here is a double LP album style so it okay. opens up in the middle and this is where I put all the basic color theory info that I felt like I could cram into two pages yeah. that would show you how the gamut mask work um, talk about value, show you how the wheel is set up on a value scale. Here's a little demonstration of the value of the color being misleading once you look at the color full saturation versus gray. Yeah, um, that's, here's a, that's a great little tool too. That's I right. know uh, that catches a lot of people. This part, this is an example of a darker skin tone overlaid on the color wheel, yeah. like a filter on top. Yeah, and I wanted to yeah, yeah. kind of make the point that every color that we could use is not going to be a good idea for sure. skin tone as it gets darker and darker. And just to elaborate on that, I think what I like to do as an oversimplification is to say, what value is my client's skin? You know, I'll try to yeah. figure out where on this scale that's they a are. a great way to look at it. Yeah. And anything that's outside or lighter than that value, mm -hmm. I pretty much call it off limits. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I would go one direction lighter. Yeah. But after that, I feel like, you know, if I use a really, really pale blue and someone with a, with a tan, that, mm -hmm. that blue is going to be a gray, yeah. basically. It's not going to be a nice color. It's not going to be what I was going for. It's not going to be what the client thought they were getting. Right. So, Right. Yeah, that's, a, that's really a great way to look at it, I think. Um, uh, and it gives you an opportunity if you were... Um, if you're thinking of the client's skin tone within that value range, then it really shows you how far you need to push those darks mm -hmm. to get nice contrast which obviously is the key to longevity and, yeah. and and clean nice tattoos is uh is nice strong uh contrast which you have the darker the skin you obviously have to push the right. contrast that much harder well the other thing is the the saturation of the colors why would you mm -hmm. use a color that 
is already pre pre saturated or you know mm -hmm. grayed out in advance. Right. You know if your skin tone is going to do that job for you. So yeah. so you look at the client's skin and you have to add it mentally as a filter on top of the colors and try to imagine what it looks like using your experience you know yeah um maybe there's a future version of the abbott color wheel that will somehow that allows take for that, that into account that. um that that's a a booger of a problem yeah, that i haven't yeah. exactly you know figured out how to solve yeah that'd be a challenge but that would really be a beneficial thing to yeah. take on i think a lot of people will get a lot out of that um you know i uh, i mean everyone struggles with with skin tone i think and um you know, even even tattooers have been working a long time. You know, how often do you get someone that comes in and you, uh, you know, and you put some light blue or some color and then you see it come back and you're like, God, that's not at all what I didn't realize how olive you were. I didn't mm -hmm. like that's not at all what I expected that color to look like. It yeah. looks milky. It looks weird. Yeah, Light blues and light turquoises are, yeah, you know, they're, they're problematic for sure. Yeah, they know? really are. And it's too bad because they look so good when they go in. Yeah, they look amazing <laughs> yeah. when they go in. Yeah. 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 Um, all right, so the Abbott Color Wheel is available now. We've been waiting on it. It's it's out. Yeah, it's going. Yeah, it's huh? finally here. Yeah. You know, I did a Kickstarter, so mm -hmm. I think I first launched the Kickstarter almost a year ago. Wow. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. there was a, a big, massive promotional drive for like yeah. a month, and I, it was great. I was really fortunate to raise um, several thousand dollars more than I set out to raise, yeah. which meant that I could order more of them and, and, uh, and actually you know, make it a little bit more, you know, impressive than it may have been. Yeah. But, but so, also it was just nice to, to, you know, get that money in advance so I could put it into other projects and yeah. all that. So we got the, uh, finally got it in. There were multiple rounds of corrections with the printer. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it was delayed quite a bit longer than I wanted it to be, but we got it. I'm happy with it. You know, yeah, it's it looks beautiful. Thank yeah. you. Um, they're right. shipping out at, you know, as yeah. of, as of right now, people yeah. that ordered them, in advance through Kickstarter or through pre-sales or receiving them right now. Can someone order them? Do you have enough in stock that people can order them through your website now and, and they go out yep. immediately or is there a yeah. list? The Ink and Dagger Tattoo store okay. on our site has, we'll link to has them available and lots of other fun stuff too. You yeah. know, I have a, a new uh, dual disc DVD set out with Gunner. It's a oh, seminar. Really? Um, <clears throat> it was uh, the Match Made in Hell seminar that Gunner yeah. and I did. Yeah. Um, that's on, on the website now oh. and... Uh, my book, Ornamental Archive, uh, the hard copies are sold out. But you've so, got, I saw you've got a digital download right. available. Yeah, we're yeah. doing digital now, and I've started making these bonus packs. So I just put mm -hmm. out bonus pack one. It's five frames and five alternates. So just uh, adding to the content from the book, yeah. giving people more of what... I noticed that when I would see people post Ornamental Archive hashtags, it would always mm -hmm. be mostly the frames. Mm -hmm. And, and so there's other sections of the book that aren't getting as much use. Right. And so I just wanted to uh, kind of beef up that section of it. So mm -hmm. the bonus packs are five bucks and you get five designs and five alternates where I just stretched or pulled them okay. as far as I could to make them useful for a different shape. So is there any plan to do a reprint of the book? No, uh, you know, it's I still get requests for it, mm -hmm. but I don't think enough to warrant to justify that. You know, a full reprint. What I'd like mm -hmm. to do is keep putting out these bonus packs yeah and at a certain point i'll have enough bonus packs to make a book yeah that's, so that's that'll cool. be volume two yeah. you know and if the demand continues to be there if people you know keep wanting these bonus packs then that'll drive me to you know to, to, to do make another, another book but. yeah yeah that that's uh i know a lot of people me being one i just love uh, digital downloads i i like i've actually just got uh, I already had a hard copy and I got the updated version of Nick Baxter's digital book and I like it, but I yeah. just love real books. I just want to hold a book. Yeah. Uh, so that, um, well, I'm glad that's still the case. You know, the digital, yeah. digital production is obviously simple. You know, mm -hmm. when people go to my website and they buy a digital book, and they have the, it. the shopping cart just delivers it to them instantly. Yeah. So there's no waiting. Right. You know, but you don't have this legacy object that you can you know, put on a bookshelf and appreciate 30 years from now. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's yeah, there's a lot to be said for that. We just podcasted a couple of days ago with a guy named Christopher Meadows, who's a really good figure painter and his art book collection is jaw dropping. It's amazing. He has to have $50,000 worth of art books. But, uh, and we talked a lot about that. Just, uh, I don't think on camera, we talked about it after the show that he, uh, uh, he's kind of like me and that, uh, you know, I love looking at, 
uh, you know, tattoos or paintings, whatever online. And I love that you can zoom way in on high res photos, but it's not the same as whenever you like, you know, you open a book and you see the whole painting and you flip to the next page and it's like this super cropped version of the painting. You can see how the paints laying on top of each other. You can mm -hmm. see the canvas peeking through in some areas. It's so abstracted and you're just like, Oh my God, it feels <laughs> like I'm really looking at the painting. So right. yeah, there's really something to a book. Well, I, I hear you. I yeah. mean, I, I think as an artist who's gone almost completely digital for my art production mm -hmm. process, you know, having the, the reference material digital is useful. Absolutely. Um, you yeah. know, I use that illustrated monthly. Those guys are yeah. putting out some really awesome yeah, you know, reference material collections. And some of it's old out of print books that you could probably find mm -hmm. um, for free on the internet somewhere. You yeah. know, they're copyright yeah. free or, right. but you know, they're, they're putting them together in really useful collections and the price is really low. So I, I've, I've you know, looked, I think it's cool. Yeah, I, I do too. I do too. There's definitely a lot of value to it. And there's no doubt that it's going that way. And I think the newer, newer generation of artists will be, won't even consider the idea that it's any different than, uh, than owning an actual book. But just, I think, uh, you know, for me personally, I like it. Uh, I really love books, but yeah, the ornamental archive. Obviously, the color wheel. You guys should you should guys should grab whether you're a tattooer or a painter, illustrator, whatever you do. It's um it's such a simple tool to use. Um, don't let your kids open it. They'll think it's for them. My five year old nearly destroyed it. He's like, oh, what did I get? Yeah, it's like, rainbow yeah. candy. <laughs> yeah, I need that. It's like let's open it. Oh, he thought it was a record. That's what he said. He's like, yeah. let's listen to it. It's like you don't listen I've been to it. I to try that. <laughs> yeah, I just haven't time. been in the right state of mind to throw <laughs> right. it on my record player yet. <laughs> See how it sounds. <laughs> uh, the best way for people to contact you for uh, is through the Ink and Dagger website. Is that right? Yeah, Ink and Dagger Tattoo.com. Okay. And uh, if they're interested in tattoo appointments, I still do those too. Yeah. Um, you when you have time me. between creating new things. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, the shop is. Uh, we just moved. Obviously, you've yeah. been checking it out. Yeah, We're in the new place. shop right now. And really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. You guys should if you're if if you're in the Atlanta area, or if not, you know, we traveled down here. You can travel. Right. We always talk about <laughs> destination tattoos. That's my favorite thing. I love going on a trip yeah. to get tattooed. Uh, we've always have all these tattooers in my shop and in surrounding shops are just like you're always running off to get tattooed. I've never tattooed you. Why don't I get to tattoo you? I'm two or three blocks away. It's like ah, it's not much, not as much fun, man. I want to go someplace. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you guys. Uh, thanks for us. Really appreciate thanks, it. Jake. And um, really do go check out uh, check out Ink and Dagger's website. Look at the store. You'll get a lot out of this um, color wheel. Have a good one. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.